Good evening, welcome. My name is Aubrey Spears and I'm the chair of the board for Cafe Veritas. We're very glad that you're here tonight. Uh, Cafe Veritas is a local organization whose purpose is to engage the tough questions of our day through lectures and discussion groups and mentorships. Over the past 12 years, we've covered topics such as evil and suffering, recent astronomical discoveries, the neuroscience of shame, racism, beauty, music, urban planning, the ethics of food production, the list goes on. Earlier this fall, we hosted a series of events focused on encountering reality through art. And I don't want anyone here to feel like there's a bait and switch. Cafe Veritas is a Christian organization. It's grounded in and motivated by the historic Christian faith. And we believe that the Christian faith offers both a framework and a motivation for pursuing truth through dialogue with humility. And so we're grateful to live in a city that is so rich in diversity. We're grateful to live in a pluralistic society, a society that is working to take the deep differences of cultures and communities and faiths seriously. And we believe that all human beings, those we agree with and those we disagree with, all humans are worthy of careful listening. And because of this, Cafe Veritas is committed, like I said, to engaging the toughest issues of our day in an environment that invites and begs for different viewpoints to bring their best arguments, their deepest questions, their most befuddling confusions out into the open to engage these together as a pluralist community. So here's how Cafe Veritas works. We, we pick a topic that we hope is interesting and that we know is important to our city. We find an expert or experts on the topic. We invite them to come and speak and to help us explore it together. The title for tonight is, as you see on your, the screens, for richer or poorer, what dating, living together, marriage, and divorce have to do with happiness and success today. We've invited Skip Berzamato. He's a senior instructor of sociology at Bridgewater College to be our speaker. He received a BA and an MA in sociology from the University of Memphis and an MDiv from Reformed Theological Seminary before joining the Bridgewater faculty in 2011. He was the associate director for the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, as well as the executive director of the Institute for Family Studies. His research interests include marriage. It's hard to say that, being a child of the 80s without pronouncing it marriage. It's what brings us together. Sorry, marriage, family, courtship, and dating. He also does research in food systems and hunger issues in America and the social history of jazz music. So Skip, thanks for being with us tonight. Before Skip comes up to speak, I'll just go over our schedule. There's gonna be four parts to the evening. The first, Skip is going to present this material and then Milt Matter, the executive director of Cafe Veritas, is going to moderate a Q&A. So while Skip is presenting the material, please be thinking of questions, and there'll be an opportunity to bring those questions. When the Q&A time is finished, Milt will wrap up um, things with a few comments about Cafe Veritas as an organization, and then at that point, We'll formally conclude the evening, but we'd love for you to stick around and continue to talk and look at this amazing subject. Um, all right, with all of that, Skip, come on down. We're very glad you're here. Thanks to Milt and Cafe Veritas for, uh, for in inviting me. 
Um, it's fun to be back in this auditorium. Two of my kids went to school here, so um, uh, we apologize for the for the screens. The uh, the main screen back here um, is covered by uh, the Adams Family set, uh, and you don't mess with middle school plays. So we're just going to leave it alone. Um, so um, as Aubrey said, um, I teach at the uh, at Bridgewater College. I was at um, the, the University of Virginia for several years as a marriage and family researcher. Um, really, my uh, I was a little late uh, starting college. I, I didn't start till I was 26. I'd been in the Navy um, and had uh, uh, another career, but from 1990 until today and tomorrow, um, I've sort of been obsessed with um, the, the current state of marriage and family. And, and as, as I think about it, and I, I teach classes and a senior seminar, and, and I usually incorporate uh, family issues into all my sociology classes, but um, as I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, I've been studying this for 33 years. I'm like a living longitudinal study um, and, and have seen a, a great deal of change. And what I want to do tonight is this presentation is going to be fairly, uh, fairly data driven. I'm going to stick to my notes because I am a, a, a whole, I have a whole head full of random statistics and knowledge about marriage, family, courtship, dating, um, and and if I don't stick to my notes, it, it, can get, it can get pretty ugly. You can ask my family, I have been known to pull PowerPoint out um, during dinner and say, that's a really good question. You know what, I was just, I was just doing some research and um, so we'll, um, I'm gonna stick to my notes. My wife is here, uh, Stacy. we've got uh, four children, four adult children now. I, I, kind of say that now, you know, the youngest is 21, so we can't make believe we're young. Um, so, um, so we've sort of lived a lot of what, or some of what we're going to be talking about today in our immediate family, in our extended family. Um, if you, we're going to have a Q&A time at the end, but if you have a burning question um, in the interim, um, I'll probably repeat it because this is being recorded and mic'd. Um, later on when we have the, the Q&A time, Milt will come around with a microphone and then we'll be able to capture your question. Um, but if you have a really burning question, I come from a big Italian family. We're from New York. Um, interruption is a normal part of, of, of dialogue. So feel free to just say, hey, wait a minute, can I? Um, and, and, and I will even stop a couple of times and say, any burning questions right now. If you save it for the end, that's great um, as well. Um, before I dive in, allow me to give two cautions that I, uh, that I have to give to my students uh, oftentimes. Um, I'm gonna give uh, lots of interesting, uh, or what I consider interesting, hopefully you will, um, and in some cases, alarming statistics. Please be careful about applying statistics to yourself as an individual. Um, it's, actually, um, it's actually a formal fallacy. Do you know, Milt teaches logic. Do you know what, what the formal fallacy is? Yeah, if, applying group statistics to an individual. I do not expect for you to know this because it's pretty obscure. It's called the ecological fallacy. Um, you cannot apply, if I say there's a, X percent chance of this happening, you, the chances of that happening to yourself, well, we, we just don't know that. Um, I'll, we'll let you know if it happens. Then we'll say, oh, you fell in that 50% group. So don't apply statistics to, your, to yourself. Secondly, um, and this is somewhat related to the first, um, your cousin does not provide countervailing evidence to the data. And I have to tell my students this all the time because I'll say, you know, there's a high likelihood that this or that will happen. And one of my students will raise their hand and say, yeah, but I have a cousin who, well, anecdotes are great and you can give, and anecdotes sort of liven up the conversation, but, but they don't provide uh, counter evidence to, to the data. Okay, so let me jump in with a summary 
of, uh, of where we are today. Normally, I name, I just, the name of this talk is the current state of marriage and family, but that wasn't, so, and then I gave it to Aubrey and, and well, you saw what happened to it. Um, so, but it's, it, we're going to look at the current state of marriage, dating, or not dating, I'm not going to do dating tonight, but marriage and um, divorce, cohabitation, and let me give you an overview. I will, um, normally I don't like to read to people, but because the screens are so far away, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of help you out. Here's kind of a summary of where we are in our culture. Americans, on average, are marrying at an older age, or not, not at all. Modern marriage is very fragile for certain demographic groups, but not for all, and, and I'll, I'll drill down on that in a minute. Modern relationships have added living together, what we call cohabitation, to the former relationship script or sequence. I talk about, I talk about um, cultural scripts a lot, the way we have done things, the order in which we have done things. And scripts are constantly being revised as each generation comes along. So we'll kind of talk about the modern script uh, of, uh, uh, or the addition of cohabitation into the modern script. Um, more and more children are being born into and are being raised by single parent, in single-parent households. But again, more so for some demographic groups than another, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. So there's, uh, uh, we'll see that socioeconomic status or education level is strong rela strongly related to a variety, a variety of family variables, including divorce, cohabitation. Um, what do I have up there? Okay, yeah, including divorce, uh, cohabitation and single parent homes. Okay, so let's run through some of the data. We'll start to unpack it a little bit and, and see how we're doing. So are people still getting married? Um, the number of marriages each year has declined by about 50%. Um, in, if you were to take all 18 year, 18, all Americans 18 and older in 19, 1960, 72% were already married. I use 1960 a lot because that was the historic low point for the average age of marriage. So I kind of use that as a marker. 2021 was about 51%. So there's just fewer people married in, in our culture. Um, let's look at some of the reasons for this decline in marriage rates over about the last 60 years. Um, Firstly, we're seeing a delaying of first marriage. I have up here on the screen the average age of first marriage. In 1960, again, the historic youngest, the historic low. For women, it was 20. For men, it was 23. Last year, uh, in 2021, actually, it was 28 for women and 30 for men. And for certain demographic groups and, and in urban areas, it's, it's a little bit older, 30 and 32, 33, somewhere in there. But, but that's, the, that's the average. Um, so why, you know, why the change? Why the, the increase um, in average age of first marriage? Um, we could talk about this issue all night, and, and I probably spend two, three weeks on it in, um, in my marriage and family seminar. Prior to the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, your 20s, one's 20s, were seen as a time to begin to settle down. You find a career, a spouse, you begin to enter the, the, the adult world. Um, many women lived at home until they were married. Many businesses like to hire married men rather than single men uh, because they seem to be more stable and better workers. Prior to the 60s and 70s, we say that marriage was a cornerstone event, an event upon which you built the rest of your life. So it would happen relatively younger because it was one of your first steps. Sometimes you would go to college first. Many, many college students married um, while in college and then sort of built their life out from there. For young people today, uh, for young adults today, marriage has become what we say a capstone event. 
something you do to complete your transition to adulthood after you get your education, a job, your little townhouse, your Honda Accord, you travel a little bit, and then, uh, okay, well, yeah, now I'll, now I'll, I'll think, about, um, uh, uh, think about settling down. Whenever, and I've been asking my students this for, for decades now, um, what, what they think is the, the perfect age to marry, and, and invariably they say 27 to 29. They don't want to go to 30, because 30 sounds old. But they'll say, you know, the, those late 20s. A second and contributing factor to the decline of marriage is the rise of unmarried cohabitation. I'm not even going to touch that one right now because we're going to talk about it here in just a minute. Um, thirdly, we're seeing an increase in lifelong singlehood. Um, some people, uh, especially women, um, are simply choosing not to marry at all over the course of their lifetime. Women are pursuing education. Um, something I talked about at a luncheon today, um, uh, the, the lack of marriageable men, and this is a big issue that's being talked about by economists, by social scientists, that, um, uh, that men do not seem to be adjusting to, the, to this new world we have as well as women are, and there seems to be a lack of marriageable men. I'll, I'll drill down on that more in the Q&A if you want to, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, right now because it, it's sort of a whole, whole other topic. Among the current generation, it's predicted that about 25% of young people will never marry, um, which, as a social scientist, that's a significant change to where just a, a couple of decades ago, it was at about 92%. Now they're predicting it's as low as 75%. Um, any, any burning questions on that Bef before I go to, OK, we'll go to a, another happy topic. Um, Divorce. Let's talk about divorce. Um, if you're over the age of 45, you live through the most tumultuous period of family uh, uh, period of family life in America, and that is the rise in divorce. You don't have to be able to see a single number up there. I just want you to see the slope. This is a graph of from 1960 and that historic high. The, the top of the roller coaster is 1980. That has, 1980 was the historic high point for divorce in, in America. Um, this slope, that increase from 1960 to 1980 has elicited, elicited a great deal of discussion in our general culture, among psychologists, social scientists, economists, um, Although the long-term trend in divorce has been trickling down since colonial times, the divorce rate had really leveled off after World War II to the 1960s. It was pretty, pretty stable, especially during that time of, of prosperity and high fertility rates, what we know as the baby boom. It's called that uh, because... Right after World War II, the birth rate went to above 4 million per year, and it, had, and it, stayed, until, uh, it stayed above 4 million per year until 1964. And in 1965, it dropped back down. And so the year I was born, 64, is the last year of the baby boomers. So I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm like bringing up the rear for the baby boomers. Like, like one, once I'm gone, then it's Gen Xers. You guys could, it, it's all up to you. Um, however, in the middle of the 1960s, the incidence of divorce really started to increase and more than doubled over the next 15 years to reach that historic high point in 1980. Since then, it has slowly come down, which I'll talk about um, 
I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. The one thing I did not include, and I went back and forth, there are some very good, re or not very good reasons, but there are some very understandable reasons um, now that we're looking back why the divorce rate went up. And really, it, it was the 1960s. <laughs> uh, that, that's about it. No. Um, there was one legislative issue, uh, or one leg one piece of legislation passed. What we what we call no fault divorce. Um, that's not an official title. That was something that the uh, that the media made up. But it started in 1970 in California, January 1st, 1970. Um, prior to that, if you wanted a divorce, you had to sue the other person and bring evidence into court. And if the judge didn't believe in divorce, he might just slam the gavel and say, divorce petition denied. I mean, what was dinner like that night? <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I, and so it got, and the, the governor of California in 1970, who all my students think was Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> because they have no sense of history, um, had been a famous actor and had a very public divorce to an actress named Jane Wyman. And so when Ronald Reagan became governor of California, he said that humiliating system of divorce has got to change. And he pushed the legislature in California to pass no-fault divorce laws and once and and it passed on the ballot in November of 69 went into law January 1st and within about seven or eight years most most states had some sort of no-fault divorce and now it was much less expensive and you didn't have to bring evidence which meant you didn't have to hire a private eye and all that stuff so there was one public policy piece there was also, there's also the cultural piece that led to this, this slope, um, that marriage moved from, um, from being more, to having more of an institutional view of marriage. You got married and you built a life together. You had kids, you bought a house, you had a life together to what um, my former boss, Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia called, um, and, and many others call it, more of a psychological view of marriage where personal fulfillment, personal happiness became the goal of marriage and romantic relationships. And that, that set for a much softer um, or much rockier, depending on which metaphor you want to use, foundation for marriage. And so th there are a few other reasons why that slope went up, but I think those two, the public policy piece and just the general culture and the change in the meaning of marriage um, contributes a lot of explanatory power to that. Um, now, if I were to ask you, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm nursing a cold, so I sound a little gravelly and I'm going to go to my tea here. Um, if I were to ask you what the divorce rate is in this country, most of you would say 50%, because that's what gets reported a lot. It's not 50%. It's never been 50%. It never touched 50%. And I'm not going to tell you where that number came from, but it was some really bad research that was widely published. Um, I even heard Andrea Mitchell say it on NBC News not too long ago, and I'm like, you should know better. Um, it, it's not 50%. What is the current divorce rate? I don't know. We won't know until everybody dies, right? You don't know what a, what a divorce rate is until the entire cohort is gone. And then you can say, oh, the divorce rate for that generation or that cohort was because where we're seeing the, the, the greatest increase in divorce is what they call, and, and I object to this a little bit, um, what they call gray divorce, meaning older people getting divorced. I think turning gray is highly overrated, and I think you should just go straight to bald. I don't think you need to turn gray. But they call it gray divorce. Um, plus 20-year marriages um, splitting up. 
I'm sure many of you have friends. Some of you might have experienced it yourself. As, as someone who teaches college, I see it among my college students all the time where my college students will be really upset. And it's like, man, my parents are splitting up. You know, they've been married for 25 years. Um, we're, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing a rise. So we don't know what the divorce rate is, but we can guess. It's estimated that between 35 and 45% of first marriages started in recent years will end in either divorce or separation before one partner dies. Again, I don't find this statistic to be helpful at all. And when I was at the National Marriage Project, we got calls just about three, four times a week from national media outlets asking us what the current divorce rates were. And I would try to explain to them that you really, and they're like, yeah, can I just have a number? Um, and I'd say 42. I don't know why. I just would make it up. And then I would see in the New York Times, Skip Rosamato from the National Marriage Project said, oh. <laughs> and then my friends who are all marriage and family researchers <laughs> would email me and say, where'd you get that number? I said, I don't know. It was just a number. Um, it was between 35 and 45, which is what we know. Um, the reason I don't find this helpful is because the divorce rate is very different for different demographic groups, uh, different, yeah, demographic groups um, or different cohorts. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about a national average. We saw that Divorce was, when, if I go back one, we saw that divorce was trending down a little bit um, since 1980. However, it's not declined for everyone equally. The drop in the divorce rate since the early 80s, it's gone down 30% for college educated. It's been a steep decline in divorce rates but for non-college educated, it's hardly gone down at all, only, only 6%. Um, this is what a uh, really, really great sociologist named Stephen uh, Martin uh, calls the divorce divide. Um, and he wrote a really influential paper back in 2004, and he's sort of updated it throughout the, uh, throughout the decades, um, or every few years he'll update the data a little bit, showing how we're seeing um, kind of uh, a drastic divide is what he calls what he calls it. Um, College-educated couples are about half as likely to divorce than their less educated peers. Um, I'll have more to say on the differences between college and non-college-educated um, in just a bit. But let's turn our attention to cohabitation just for a minute. Cohabitation, by definition. Two adults who are sexual partners, not married to each other, and share a household. And I always have to clear this up for my students because we're seeing so many co-ed roommate situations. That's not cohabitation. Grandma might think it's cohabitation. Dad might think it's cohabitation. But it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a sociological definition of cohabitation. Um, I don't know, young, young folks, if you want to try that on your parents, it's like, well, a sociologist said that's not cohabitation. Um, I, we tend not to have a lot of weight with dads and grandmas. Um, so again, I'm just going to show you a picture of the slope. You don't have to see a single number. This is how cohabitation has changed from, um, from 1960 to 2015, I think that says. Is that what it says, Declan? Is that 2015? Okay, 2015. Um, so we see the, the, the rise. It was, you know, it was very, very rare. Um, something that people only in Berkeley, California did back in the 1960s. <laughs> um, but, but now it is, um, it is commonplace for many, Cohabitation is a prelude to marriage. For others, simply an alternative to living alone. But for a growing number of Americans, it is becoming an alternative to marriage. Um, put simply, in the eyes of young adults in the US, 
non-marital cohabitation has become a normal part of the life course, a normal part of their script. Um, some really nice research out of the University of Michigan was done a few years ago where 25 to 29 year olds were asked the question, how many of you would only marry someone if they agreed to living, live with you first? You would only get married, like you wouldn't even consider it. So it's the highest level on a Likert scale. You would only get married, you would only marry someone um, if they agreed to live, and 48% of 25 to 29 year olds said, yeah, I will only marry if they agree to live with each other first. And which is really unfortunate because cohabitation is not a predictor of marital success. Um, there's, there's been a lot of research out there. I'll talk about one person in a minute who's been doing some research on that. It used to be, 20 years ago, we said it was a predictor of divorce. Um, cohabitation was a predictor of divorce. I don't think we could really say that because it gets into some really weird causation stuff. Um, are there other variables causing that strong connection between cohabitation and divorce? But we do know that is not a predictor of marital success. Um, I'm oftentimes asked how, um, the, how long cohabitation relationships last in, in America. Um, if, I, if I was to ask you, uh, okay, here, you get to talk back. Um, what do you think is the average length of a cohabitating relationship in America? Give me a number. Three years? Five years? <laughs> Man, you're dark. <laughs> 18 to 24 months is the average length of a cohabiting relationship. Um, we're, we're really influenced by movies. We might be looking at Northern Europe where they have more of a culture of long-term uh, cohabiting relationships, but we really don't have that. There's a really nice piece of research. I'm about to put it up here, and it's got lots of little tiny numbers on it, but it's okay. All you need to look at are the colors. Um, yep. Okay. So here's our colorful little chart. Okay. Don't worry that you can't read any of that. As long if you're colorblind, then then we're gonna have to um, then I'll have to explain it. But this was some really nice research done by a graduate student at Bowling Green State University named Esther Lamidi. Um, she's now gone on. She's teaching in the University of California system. I saw some of her research pop up recently. Um, but this was some graduate research that she did. What she did is she wanted to look at, um, and I'm going to, uh, I need to consult my notes here, kind of small, I need to consult my screen too. Um, she wanted to see what happened to cohabiting relationships after five years. And she broke it out by education levels. College or more is on the far right. Usually in the social sciences, we just look at three levels of education college, high school grad, or, or high school dropout. Um, she actually went four levels. The, the next one from the right is some college. The, the next one is high school or a GED. And then the far left is less than a high school diploma. And so looking at the three colors, after five years, what happened to that relationship? The the yellow or mustard color there, it's mustard on my screen, the yellow um, is that they've broken up. The middle section, the blue section, is that they married. And then the bottom is that they were still cohabiting. So if you look at college educated, you'll see, and, and, and she did some historic comparison um, she looked at two different data sets. I'm just looking at the ones on the right, which are more current, the 2005 to 2009. She updated this a couple of years ago. It hasn't changed much, so I haven't updated this, um, this slide. But you'll see that after five years, if you were a college graduate, most of those had converted to marriage, about 59% 
had converted to marriage, and about 34% had broken up. And just from my time, my, my years at the University of Virginia, I would see this a lot among graduate, uh, grad school couples or recent undergrads. They got engaged. They both got jobs in Northern Virginia. They didn't want to get two apartments just for a year. So they got one apartment, and technically they cohabitated for their engagement period or going into their engagement period. Um, but usually those were fairly short-lived, obviously no more than five years. And then, I'm not going to read you all the numbers, but you can just see the drastic difference just by looking at that blue on the right-hand column for each, each education level that obviously cohabitation means something different for college educated than for the rest of the country. And, and I can give you a lot more data. I don't want to kill you with statistics and data, but I just thought this was a, a, a nice summary of just a nice graphic picture of what it, what it looks like. Um, it gets even more complicated when we talk about if there's kids in the house or no kids, and I won't go into all that. Um, we just cohabitate very differently in America than the rest of the world, as, as, as I said. Um, a great sociologist, um, a, a friend and former mentor of mine who passed away, Stephen Nock, at the University of Virginia, um, he coined the term um, or, or, or labeled cohabitation in America an incomplete institution. Um, and I bring this up with my students a fair bit because if, any, if anyone in here is cohabiting, you, you know how difficult it is just to sort of introduce the other person. Like, we don't even have a name for it. This is my partner? Well, you in business together? This is my significant other. I've got a good friend who introduces his cohabiting partner as his significant other. Well, we, we don't have a name for it, and language is important. And so, um, legally, for those of you who might be in the law profession or like my wife is an accountant, um, the government really doesn't recognize cohabiting relationships. Um, if if you're cohabiting, you could be cohabiting for 20 years and your partner is in an accident and end of life decisions need to be made. You, unless there's documentation, you have no right. But a mother who maybe he hasn't talked to in 20 years can walk in and make end of life decisions. Like, so our, our whole system, our whole culture really hasn't figured out what to do with, with cohabitation. We don't really have common law marriage. It's like, well, we've been together for 20 years. I mean, there's some forms of it in certain states for certain things, but it's not institutionalized, <clears throat> excuse me, which is what led Stephen Nock um, to, to label it an incomplete institution. And I have lots of friends um, who, who are cohabiting couples or, or did cohabit, and and, and they, you know, we sort of have a little support group, you know, and they'll say, yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of hard to explain. Boy, if we were in Denmark or Sweden, it'd be really easy to explain because it's been, it's been institutionalized into the culture uh, a little bit. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in digging deeper on this, um, these are my three go-to a book called Cohabitation Nation by Sharon Sassler up at Cornell University, um, The Marriage Go Round by Andrew Churlin, which has become kind of a standard text now for, for marriage and family uh, scholars. Um, my favorite is a friend of mine, Scott Stanley, out at the University of Denver. Um, he did a lot of work with us at the National Marriage Project and still does a lot of work for the Institute for Family Studies. Um, he has a blog called Sliding Versus Deciding. And young adults out there who are still dating and all, you should read some of the articles on sliding versus deciding. 
Um, because he really talks about, he and his research partner named Galena Rhodes, um, they're both psychologists at the University of Denver, <clears throat> although Galena's in private practice, uh, she's a therapist as well, really do a great job and do some really nice research. Um, Scott, uh, Scott Stanley writes all of the healthy family curriculum for the U.S. Army and works a lot with military families on how to have, um, how to have healthy marriage. He's done all these healthy marriage initiatives. But he's an expert on the sliding versus the siding. One really quick statistic, and I'm getting off my notes, and this is dangerous, but um, he and Galena um, interviewed 200 cohabiting couples. And they had them come in, they were all in the Colorado area, and he split them up. And, and they interviewed them separately. In 30% of the cases, they didn't actually agree that they were cohabiting. It was usually the guy who was like, no, we're not cohabiting. And the girl would say, oh, yeah, we're cohabiting. It's like they both have leases, but they're kind of staying over. And you guys know how, how, how the script goes. Um, in 40-something can't remember the exact number, 40 something percent of the cases, they could not identify when they started cohabitating. So it's not like they're doing the, hey, it's time for us to move in together and they have a, you know, they have, they have the talk and then they, you know, and then they go sign a lease. It's, and this is why his blog is called Sliding Versus Deciding, that, that a lot of relationship formation today is sort of just kind of slid into um, and not, not as, as declared. Um, I rarely get any pushback from my undergraduates or graduate students on this. They'll be like, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. Okay, um, oh yeah, we're, we're closing in. Let me, let, me, let me pick up the pace here. Non-marital childbearing, because this is where we see a great deal of, of change. Overall, about 41% of children born in the US in 2019 were to unmarried mothers. The rate is 53% if we just look at children born to mothers 30 years or younger. Okay, so we take out the 30 plus age mothers, then 53% of kids. So 53 out of 100 kids were born to single moms. Um, I'm going to skip over this one because it's too hard to read um, and go to um, by education level. Again, we see a great divide in who is having children when they're not married. For those with a bachelor's degree, it is extremely low. All the women in 2016 who had a bachelor's degree and had a baby, 10 out of 100 were not married. It's fairly low. But go to, you just jump to the other side, to the less than high school, and you'll see that it was 62 out of 100 babies born to moms who are high school dropouts. And again, one thing I really um, drill down on um, in, in my seminars and with my students is the difference that has emerged in our culture between a bachelor's degree and non-bachelor's degree um, when it comes to the, so many of these family, family statistics. I should note that the uh, America, the U.S. is kind of an exception here. Um, the Pew, in 2019, um, Pew Research Center studied 130 countries and territories and found that 23% of, of children in the U.S. under the age of 18, 23% under the age of 18, lived with a single parent. That was the three times higher than the average for the rest of the world. Mexico's like seven. Um, Canada's like 15% um, to just look at our north and southern neighbors. Um, so what's the big deal, right? 
because you start bringing this up, um, some argue that when we start talking about non-marital, um, um, not non um, um, when we start talking about um, uh, single mothers, we are somehow engaging the culture wars, um, which is really the third rail in polite conversation. You know, as a sociologist, um, it is not my job nor my intention to peek into people's bedroom windows and, and tell them how they should or should not be behaving. Um, that, that, that's just not what my field does. It's certainly not my intention to shame anyone, make them feel guilty, especially for circumstances that might, be, might have been out of their control. I'm sure some of you grew up with single parents. Um, some of you might be single parents right now and have done just fine. I, I lived with a single mom for, for my fifth and sixth grade year, and look at me now. <laughs> you laughed a little too hard. Um, so what's the big deal? Um, as I've sought to answer that question, as a social scientist, not as a Christian, but as a, as a social scientist, my thinking has really been greatly influenced by, um, by, these, by these two um, social scientists. Robert Putnam's Our Kids, um, both of these books <laughs> I've assigned this semester and I'm finishing up and, um, with, with my students and they tend to, to really like them. Um, but my thinking has really greatly been influenced by Robert Putnam, great social scientist, came up with the uh, rope bowling alone uh, about the uh, fragmentation of, of local communities several years ago. He wrote this book called Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. And then a brand new book is out. I got an advanced copy. Now it's, um, now it's finally published called The Two-Parent Privilege by Melissa Kearney, who is a... Um, an economist at University of Maryland. Um, Robert Putnam is a political scientist at Harvard. <clears throat> what we know from the data is that children's outcomes in life are profoundly shaped by family and home experience. Let me give you a Kearney quote here. Children who have the benefit of two parents in their home tend to have more highly resourced enriched, stable childhoods, and they consequently do better in school and have fewer behavioral challenges. Now, it's easy to say that it's simply a matter of financial resources. And this is where we argue as social scientists, that it doesn't matter if a child grows up with a single parent or two parents, or it doesn't matter. What matters is resources, financial resources. Um, if a single parent had enough economic resources to more than adequately provide for the child, then that's all they need. However, as we hear over and over and over again, and Kearney provides a great deal of data in her book, um, there are resources that a second parent in the household provide uh, besides economic ones. Social scientists have identified Three, certainly economic resources. But children's outcomes, good outcomes for kids, has been linked to time spent with kids. And you know if you're a single parent, you're dividing your time a lot. And emotional bandwidth and mental energy. Kids are kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. And you just need, like, it's like, okay, you need to deal with this. I'm, I'm done. And we've all done that as parents. I might have done it a little more than other parents, but it's like, I can't, no, I can't deal with this. Make this go away. Um, and so these type, and Kearney really sort of spells this out, has lots of good data from psychologists, um, as far as I know, neither one Kearney or Putnam 
have any religious or cultural acts to grind. Um, they, they pretty much just sort of call it as the experts see it. Okay, let me wrap up with this, and then we'll, we'll have Q&A time. Um, what's the future of the family? Um, is it going to be okay? Is it going to decline? Is it just changing? Is it just simply evolving? During the week of April 10th in 2023, the Pew Research Center surveyed 5,073 houses across America, asking their opinion about the future of the country in, in several different areas. But because Pew are great family researchers up there, um, they asked a lot of family questions too. Just let me share with you too, um, and this is gonna be a little hard to read, um, Many Americans are pessimistic about the future. Here's the question that was asked. Percent saying, thinking about the future of our country, in general, they feel blank about the institution of marriage and family. So 40% were pessimistic, 26% were optimistic, and 29% were like, yeah, I don't know. They also asked, marriage and parenthood are seen as less important to, oh, I'm sorry, the question is, percent saying each is extremely or very important. So if you have like a, a, a five level Likert scale, these would be the top two, extremely or very important, in order for people to have a fulfilling life. Having a job or a career they enjoy, 71%. Answered there, having close friends, 61%. Having children was at 26%. And if you jump to the bottom, being married, 23% said that it's extremely or very important in order for people to have a fulfilling life. We're really seeing a dramatic change in, in the way we think about uh, marriage and family and what is happening to, uh, to the family in America. And, and what I wanna um, press is that we seem to be, um, there's, in America there seems to be two different scripts pertaining to marriage and family. One for the highly educated young people and others for moderately or low educated young people. I, t I tell my college students, for, for People with a bachelor's degree, your life script is pretty much the same as your great grandmother's. You're just doing it at a later age. But you're getting your education, you're kind of figuring out what you might want to do, and then you're getting married and you're having kids and in that order. For less than college educated, the script it can get really messy. Um, and it's really different. And marriage seems to be becoming what uh, kind of the, the father of marriage and family scholarship it was a sociologist named Frank Furstenberg. And he, years, decades ago now, said that marriage is becoming a luxury good for the well educated. He started to identify this divide several times several decades ago. A luxury good meaning something that's not accessible to, um, to everyone and that not everyone can benefit from. Um, I think this is an issue that we as community members, we as family members, if you're in a religious organization, as a religious organization, um, I know uh, as a Christian, this is something that I think about a lot, like, what, what can we do to, to, to help both, both sides of, of this divide? Okay, I'll stop there and we'll do some questions. We got time? What defines a marriageable man? Oh, yes. Oh, you just baited Skip there. God. Skip, you get no more than five minutes on this answer. Someone who will financially and emotionally um, support their partner. 
Financially, that's linked to education a lot. Or um, what I really call for is more internships, more trade schools, um, good paying, good paying labor jobs um, because we, we need them. We need, I don't know how to fix my car anymore. I used to, um, but I don't. Um, I, my refrigerator goes on the blink. I have to make a phone call now. Um, and, and, but a lot of these entry level jobs are not well paying. And so guys don't want to jump in for $15 an hour. Um, it's, it's not worth it to them. And so because, okay, I'll be really quick. I promise. Um, there is such a mismatch in education level between guys and girls. 60% of all undergraduates are women. Um, they graduate at an 8% higher rate. Um, they are, enter, women are entering the most lucrative fields. I talked today at, at a luncheon about the fact that women have infiltrated what used to be male-dominated fields, but men are very reluctant to enter into those heel jobs, health, education, administration, and logistics. Um, and so women, especially educated women, are saying, well, what Barbara Defoe Whitehead named her book, there's no good men left. On the other side of the divide, some <laughs> Lori Gottlieb, who's a wonderful psychologist out in California, very provocatively wrote an Atlantic cover piece um, that turned into a book called Marry Him, basically arguing that women are too picky. And herein lies the debate. And I can just say that. I usually do it when I have a sore throat because I could just do that in my undergraduate class and just let them go after each other. Um, uh, and, and so a marriageable man is a moving target because I will have my students write that, write that down and I'll put it all up on the board. And it's like, come on. That can't, you know, doesn't have bad breath. It's like, well, come on. You know, that was that was an, actually uh, uh, an illustration that Lori Gottlieb, she Yale trained psychologist, she stopped dating a guy because she didn't like his breath. And that's what made her stop and, and say, OK, I'm 32 years old and I haven't had a relationship longer than three months. Maybe I'm being a little picky. But there really is an issue of marriageability um, because of the way women have attacked. I know we still hear about the 83 cents on the dollar. Women are making 83 cents on the dollar. That is not the case for, for women who are graduating now. It's 93 cents, and in urban centers, it's 98 cents. And the reason that there's still a mismatch is because women leave the workforce to have children. And that's when men continue, women leave the workforce, and when they come back, maybe they don't come back with the same drive or at the same level that they did before. And so that's where we're seeing the, the mismatch. But as far as money being offered to men and women out the door, unless you're a real Neanderthal, you're not going to say, well, she's a girl, she's probably going to end up getting married and pregnant, so I don't need to pay her as much as a guy. First of all, that's a federal offense. Second of all, um, <laughs> second of all, most employers are not doing that as much anymore because it's too easy to see. Yeah. Oh, there, there were like there was a whole semester worth of questions or uh, responses in that. Is a, a prominent um, Canadian psychologist has asserted that women can't marry down sociologically. Men can. And if there's a mismatch uh, in the number, you said 60% are women are graduating it's in higher, higher degrees. Yep. So the higher the degree, the smaller the 
the pool of candidates is could yep. you that on? yeah that's called um that's called the marriage gradient um that men will marry down educationally but women don't want to marry down educationally that we're starting to see movement there because just um looking at the um the 2020 census data that came out how many married couples there are where the where the woman has higher education level than the man, we're seeing that go up. And so the marriage gradient is being talked about right now. Is that still the case that, that men will marry down educationally, but women won't? Is there more, back to the marriage ability question, is there more to it than just education level? We don't know yet, but we did see it in the new census that it seems to be balancing out a little bit. Mm -hmm. How is the increase in LBGDQ uh, numbers right now in our culture affecting all your statistics? Yeah, you know, um, I look at it every time it comes out because, because gay marriage is so new. We're, we're still looking at longitudinal data. Some of the first, um, I, what I'm really interested in is divorce rates. And I want to see if there's going to be a difference in divorce rates among gay, gay men couples and lesbian couples. And it looks like lesbians are divorcing at a little higher rate. Um, but be quite honest with you, it hasn't really taken off like they thought it would. Most, uh, I was just looking at some new Pew research just a few days ago that came out on who is um, the, the demographic data on gay and lesbian married couples. And um, most are between the ages of 50 and 60. So young people, and we were talking about this in my class the other day, um, how will young LGBTQ young people, will they are they thinking differently about marriage and the script than heterosexual couples? And, and, and by the time this data comes out, I probably won't be on solid food anymore um, because it's gonna require a few decades. And so, um, but, but I really encourage my students who are thinking about graduate work in psychology and sociology, that this is something to, th th this is gonna be an area of research going forward. Is there a difference? Is it the same? Yeah, so we don't know, but um, a lot of people speculate. Um, the American Psychological Association keeps coming out with all this stuff, but there's nothing behind it but speculation. You know, I wanna see the data. I wanna see how many are getting together, how long cohabiting relationships are lasting among that community as opposed to heterosexual couples. So, so it's, who has a college degree and who doesn't? Um, 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 gay and lesbian, men and women tend to be higher educated. So their, their rate of bachelor's degrees are hot, much higher than the general public. Other questions? Oh, Dave, Rosie, you're in the middle, man. All right. We I'll, can, I'll, we I'll, can, re I'll repeat it. We can do this. Mm -hmm. He can be yeah, I think, so the, the question was what makes, what makes a college degree kind of so special? Why is it this, this, this such a strong variable? Um, I think first and foremost, it's a financial, that those with a bachelor's degree make a lot more money. Um, and, the, and the data, you know, look, my, my mother ran an air conditioning business for years, and, and her boss did not have a high school diploma, but had two boats and a lake house. Okay, we all, you know, we all, we all know, um, we all know that person, but it's not the average, it's not, it's not typical. Um, so I think to answer your question, firstly, it's, it's um, financial resources. Secondly, there are skills that you actually learn. It's not just the piece of paper. College students, I'm sorry, I know you want the piece of paper, but there are some of us who actually think, you're gonna learn something along the way too. That might be cool, right? Maybe? 
I know you want the piece of paper, and we'll give it to you, I promise. But, but you might learn something. And so critical thinking skills, um, the ability to, um, to negotiate, to compromise, all of that is associated with higher levels of, of education. What about religion? Either religion in general or any particular religion that you know, you have identified college education as the single, it, it appears to me, the, the, single the strongest or the strongest mm -hmm. variable mm -hmm. to uh, stability, yep. to a child being raised in a two parent home. Yep. Stronger than religion? Yes. Not, it used to not be. When I first started this, it Can was. Can you talk about that? Yeah. yeah. So, um, if you, okay, so if you're both college educated and highly religious, man, you're, you're just flat out Victorian. Like, you, I mean, the divorce rate is very low. The cohabitation rate is very low. Um, you, uh, it's in s low single digits. But as far as, um, I get myself in trouble here a little bit, and I've gotten myself in trouble. I'm a Roman Catholic, and I was addressing a room full of, of bishops, priests, and deacons. And I had some data up on the screen about annulments. Now, if you know anything about the Catholic Church, they don't believe in divorce, but they grant annulments, meaning they grant that the marriage never happened, basically, is what they're saying, that it was never valid. Um, there were, I'm going to get my numbers wrong here, my starting date, 30 years ago, there were about 500 annulments granted per year by the Catholic Church in the U.S. The data I looked at, which was 2018 data, there were 35,000 annulments granted. And I said, my dear bishops, priests, and deacons, Annulments is Catholic divorce. And, and it, was like, it was like English Parliament. Like they were like, rrr, rrr, and they were like stood up and it's like, you're a heretic. I had some sweet little seminarian call me a heretic and all. And, <laughs> um, the religion, because of the decline in religion, the rise of the nuns, as we, as we call them in, in sociology, those who identify as not religious at all, N-O-N-E-S. Um, religion does not have the culture-shaping power that it used to have. Even very institutionalized denominations like Roman Catholicism or single single church um, uh, congregations. They might for that congregation, but as far as leavening power and because numbers are down, they just don't have the, they just don't have the power and the weight that, that they used to. And, and you've probably read the same books I have by Robert Withnow and others who, who sort of chronicle this. George Barna has done some decent work on this. And, and, and others. Um, it, 30 years ago, religion married, mattered more than education. Now education matters way more than religion. So we've seen recently in the news a rising sentiment, especially amongst like late high school aged men, um, that college is just increasingly not worth it, even if you're looking at their economic ability to afford it, just an opting out of that. But with how the predictive of success, if we define marriage as success at least, um, having that bachelor's is, how can we better communicate possibly uh, the, the non-tangibles that come along with that bachelor's education that you mentioned? Yeah, and, and I am not an advocate that everybody needs to go to college. So don't walk away going, you know, this was just an infomercial for, for four-year colleges. Even though our tuition at Bridgewater College is very reasonable, as you've seen in the commercials with my good friend and president, David Bushman. Um, um, that's on tape, isn't it? Yes. 
I was just kidding, President Bushman. <laughs> um, so um, we as a, a society, we need to figure out our disappearing middle class and what are we going to do to put people to work because we do need, we need workers. We all know that since COVID, um, you know, employers, some of you who are business owners are having an incredible difficult time hiring people. And I think it's narrow, too narrow just to say, these guys don't want to work, they just want to sit in their basements and play video games. I, I think too highly of, of this generation of, of young people. I just don't think they think it's worth it. And I think we have to make it worth it for them. I don't think they're lazy. And some of you might disagree with me. Um, I don't think they just want to sit around and, you know, and just play um, whatever the latest PS is. What are we up to, six now? I don't know. I don't play video games. Um, but we have an alive in their imagination. Because I've seen what happens when, when a young person, especially a young man, gets fired up about something. And then they sort of come to life. And so I just think we as a society, business owners, local communities, religious organizations, need to keep working to alive in the imagination for young men. And any time we suggest any sort of special treatment for men, we get a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. Because women are like, hey, we clawed our way out of, of the mud to get where we are now. And now you want to throw, you, you want to throw freebies to the very people who were keeping us down? And we get this pendulum swing. And I just don't believe in pendulum swings because Unfairness and inequality on one side becomes unfairness and inequality on the other side. And so why can't we do both? Why can't we continue to fight for equal pay, equal rights? The government has done, uh, the U.S. military has done a really good job of, of parental leave, where they're allowing women now three months um, to take off when they have a baby, and then both parents or either either service person can then take an additional three months off. Um, we don't see parental leave. Um, we don't see fair wages. We don't see health insurance. And so a lot of the guys are just, I think they're just potential energy that we just haven't alive. And the women have just, they're like, yes, give us all these careers. Give us athletics, give us, <laughs> give us STEM fields, give us, you know, there's more women in law school, there's more women in med school. Um, the, um, there's more MBA men than there are women. Um, engineering is even starting to balance out again. The natural sciences graduate, more PhDs and EDDs are going to women than to men. Um, and so now, why can't we continue along that path? but then say, hey, we have this other half here who's not coping very well with this changing nature of our workforce that we've seen over the last few decades. What, what can we do? Can we offer scholarships for men to go into these heel fields? Do we have more internships, more apprenticeships? Um, there's some public policy things that that um, that um, <clears throat> uh, that policymakers could could do as well. Again, tonight was presented by Cafe Veritas. I already told you a few words. Uh, Cafe Veritas is a nonprofit educational organization here in Harrisonburg. We strive to engage the tough questions of our time through lectures, through book discussions, through mentorships. Um, we do this in the name of a flourishing community. We want these discussions to continue, not just to present data. We've mostly presented data. How do we address this in our community? We need to figure this out together. So let's please keep the conversation going after this. I'd like to thank some of our 
helpers tonight, which includes some of the Cafe Veritas Fellows group. This is 10 college seniors who have been reading um, eight books with me this year and uh, going hard after cultural issues and how we can make a difference in the world. Um, so thanks to Declan, to Forrest, to Kayla, and to Aaron. Uh, thanks to Aubrey, thanks to all of you, and thanks again, Skip.